Hi, it's Lee from ColouringQueen.net and it's been a while uh, since we've chatted. A lot has been happening in the meantime in my personal life. So if you don't want to hear about that, just turn the sound off and listen to something else. Today I am colouring from Autumn Memories, which is a set of postcards from Carolina Kubikowska one of my very favorite artists i just love her style i love all the black that she uses and look if i was ever going to get a tattoo i'd be flying to poland and getting her to do it that is definitely for sure It'd probably be the little girl from ticket to dreams with a bunny rabbit on it naturally uh, that's always been my thought but you know one day I shall get there and get uh, Carolina's beautiful artwork somewhere on me so then I can look at it all the time. But in the meantime, I'm going to colour the Carolina Kubikowski colouring card from Autumn Memories today. I'll put a link to buy this postcard set below. I'm going to use my Karen Dash Neo Colour 2 watercolours on it. And I actually have a colour palette that I will be using today. I'll put a picture of that up somewhere on this screen so that you can see it. It's actually a colour palette challenge that we're doing in my Facebook group and it's based on like a retro Palm Springs vibe colour scheme. And the reason that it's Palm Springs vibe is I've been looking for a different house uh, for us to live in or to rent, whatever. Uh, but there's a bit of a rental crisis in Australia at the moment, so I don't know that we would be lucky enough to be able to rent. But anyway, in all my inspiration, there's a lot of houses coming up that have been recently renovated, and they're renovated in a Palm Springs style. So lots of white and lots of, you know, pinks and plants that are generally Palm Springs. Everyone seems to have a different interpretation on uh, what Palm Springs style is, but yeah, for me it's a, like a lot of white and pinks and plants and sort of single level and that sort of vibe, but I've been looking at a lot of houses and seeing if there's one, you know, that we could get in maybe within our budget and still have enough left over to renovate it in that style. But so far, I am coming up completely empty, <laughs> so nothing. But anyway, uh, Carolina, before I move on and tell you all the stuff that's been happening in our life, which, you know, it's not that exciting. It's just more of the same saying. Carolina actually has a new colouring book out and it's called Rise and it looks absolutely stunning. She is ready to ship it out and I'll put a link to it below. Oh, and also Etsy artist Lana Green that always does a lot of lovely coloring pages. They're really beautiful portraits and very soft and beautiful style. Like if you like Christine Caron and uh, Grazia Salvo, you would like Lana Green's style, I'm sure. Anyway, she has actually got her first coloring book out and it looks just stunning. As far as I know, she's just shipping from the Amazon US store at the moment because she actually sent them over. They're not printed on Amazon paper. There, are, she's had them printed and they're just on the Amazon US store at the moment. I don't know if she's shipping them to other places. The best way is, uh, if you want to find out information like that, is just have a look on the artist page. She's got one on Facebook and on Instagram as well. So you can have a squiz there and see uh, where else she's selling it. But absolutely looks stunning. So uh, on the weekend, we went up to the Sunshine Coast, about an hour and a half, two hours from where we live. And uh, we went up there for Buddy. Uh, Buddy has been having seizures like two to three times a day, sometimes more. And uh, if you're experienced with epilepsy, you know that this is just not good. And he's on so much medication. It's sort of really wearing him out and 
it's you know six times a day and it's pretty exhausting and you know because David gets up so early in the morning when Buddy has seizures I'm the the one that's up with him uh, you know often all night because after he has a bad seizure he often paces around for three or four hours and uh, I have to make sure he doesn't hurt himself and as well as all these seizures he's been having he's started doing some really weird stuff uh, like trying to climb into a bookcase or walking around with a table on his head or a chair uh, and so I wasn't sure if this was the effect of new medication with him or if it's a what's called a psychomoto seizure which is just like a a seizure where they do sort of weird stuff and odd behavior and uh, so he pretty well after discussing it with his specialist uh, he pretty well feel that it's a, a a different type of seizure probably if you want to label it a psychomotor seizure but it's just really worrying because obviously I have to move everything out of the way and he gets in between things, chairs, you name it, in between like the bathtub and the vanity, in between pot plants and it's just really odd and I can't get him to move and I have to sort of lift him out and whatnot. And he's no lightweight, although he has lost a few kilos, he is no lightweight and lifting up the 32 kilo dog is uh, not my idea of a good time. David can do it without any problems, but he's got great guns and, you know, he's used to uh, lifting up heavy things in his job in construction. But for me, I really struggle. But anyway, so I did some Googling and we've taken Buddy to a holistic vet in the past. And to be honest, it it didn't work as expected. It, it just nothing seemed to happen like we bought all of these expensive herbs and cbd oil and a little bottle tiny little bottle cost 380 dollars so it wasn't cheap i know in the us you guys get it so much cheaper but that's what we paid at a compounding pharmacy here in queensland and uh, none of it made any difference we changed his diet to a raw food diet and you know at some stage I think that diet actually made him sick because we had to take him to the emergency vet um, we've over the last uh, couple of months he's been to the emergency vet more times than I've had hot breakfasts and I think at some stage you know one of the raw components might have had a parasite or something in it according to the vet and the blood work that they did on him because uh, he was violently ill he was really ill and at one stage I had Buddy sick and I also had Millie our cat who's never sick never a problem she was also sick as well so if you've ever had to bath a cat a few times <laughs> and a cat that hates being touched yeah you'll know how I feel covered in scratches and all the rest of it but you know she fortunately recovered within a couple of days and I didn't have to take her to the vet but buddy of course we had to take to emergency a couple of times and and also to his regular specialist so it's been a bit of a roller coaster with buddy but I did some googling and I found a different holistic vet up on the Sunshine Coast that's had some experience with epilepsy in dogs. And uh, we took him up there last weekend, had a sort of little day out in the country, a bit of a country drive, although it was a bit rushed because David actually worked four hours, came home, got changed, and then we, we drove up. But he had a consultation with this holistic vet and she was just really really lovely buddy loved her he was sort of all over her like a rash and she gave him a treat you know which always helps <laughs> and uh, so he had some acupuncture and he had like a little massage and he got some little herbs and stuff to add to his diet and he got a new diet which is basically like a lot of cooked food and also different foods that will help his epilepsy. So we, you know, came back and, you know, made up all this food and his herbs and, you know, 
organise a little system for trying to work out when to massage him because we've got homework. <laughs> so we have to massage him every night. And so all of these herbs, you know, I was putting in little bags so that we could just put in as we need them. And honestly, I was amazed like he slept the whole way home and he was just so peaceful and the next day he was so happy and we took him out to the park he had a great time and he was so relaxed and for the first time in months he didn't have a seizure at all not even a small seizure, which are called focal seizures. And he didn't do any of the weird stuff, like trying to call into the bookcase, which, hey, I don't want a dog crawling through my colouring books. <laughs> but he didn't do anything weird. And then the next day, he was, again, he was really happy. He was so full of energy he was just like a different dog. I called him Buddy 2.0 because he was just so, so good. And the holistic vet wanted us to actually reduce the medication that he's on. And I contacted his neurologist uh, to see if, you know, that was appropriate. Even though she's a licensed vet, the holistic vet, I wanted to run it by the specialist. So... I didn't reduce his medication until I heard back from his, his specialist that it was okay to do it gradually and I have to do a weaning off process. But like for three days, we had Buddy 2.0, full of energy, happy all the time, attentive, wanting to be near me and best of all, no seizures of any type. And then... Yesterday, it all went downhill, like at about five o'clock, I went to get him for his walk, thinking he'd be happy as to go for his walk, like he had been every other day, and instead, I seen that he had had a seizure, he had all the telltale signs that he'd had, like a small seizure, which is called a focal seizure, and the really strange thing is, but he's non-vocal. He doesn't bark. He doesn't wolf in. He doesn't do anything. The most he ever does is if he sees a hot looking doggy, he'll go, mm -hmm. but he doesn't make any wolf wolfs or barks or anything. And he actually cried three times during this seizure, you know, let out these whimpers and they were really loud. It was really heartbreaking just didn't know you know what to do for him because he's never been like that before then of course about two hours later he had another one and again he whimpered and he's never done that before and then of course a couple of hours afterwards he had a huge seizure and again you know he cried and it's just really weird so I'm waiting on all the experts to come back to me. I've emailed them all this morning and, you know, alerted them that he's whimpering now and it's so unusual. He never vocalises at all. So I hope that someone's got some suggestions for us. But in the meantime, we're keeping up his new diet and his herbs and hopefully uh, time, because it's only been a few days and he's only had one acupuncture session so hopefully with time you know we'll get more of these three days of you know where he's really really good um, because otherwise I don't know what I'll do and I was feeling pretty smug that he was three days and I was feeling really good about it and by last night I was totally deflated and ready to cry but it's early days, it's early days and uh, a lot of people have had great success with the homeopathic treatment so I hope Buddy is one of those success stories. I really want to see his face on the vet's website saying, you know, he was, uh, you know, so over medicated and so much and now he's really good. So we can only hope and next week he's going for some more acupuncture 
and so hopefully he will be doing well soon got to be optimistic about this and be positive so yeah that's buddy's story and and millie and billy the little dog that i mind i was minding her the other week and she got violently sick and i wasn't able to take her to her the vets where her mummy actually works because uh, I just had uh, a little procedure myself and I wasn't able to drive. And so her mummy had to race home from work and get her and uh, she's been in the hospital for the last couple of days and I won't get to play with her uh, this week uh, at all. So she'd been sick the night before and a couple of days before uh, with her mummy and um, yeah, then... When she came over, she was just really violently ill. And so, yeah, poor little thing. So hopefully she'll be better soon and I'll see her next week because I miss the little cutie pie. She's she's such a little tinkerbell. She's got so much energy and she's such a gorgeous little girl. So, And her and Buddy and her and Millie have a pretty good time until it comes to dinner time when she tries to take everyone's meal. So I always have to get her home before she starts trying to eat everyone else's dinner. Because it's amazing how tiny she is and how much she can eat. So anyway, um, why I haven't done a colour in chat is because I've been sick. Well, first of all, there was this virus going around in Queensland and they called it a superbug. And... I didn't really think much of it because I rarely go out and I didn't think that I would catch it. But surprisingly, David caught it and he's the type of guy that's only sick once every couple of years. But when he does get the flu or a virus or something, it hits him hard and it really hit him hard. So I, you know, made up the special chicken and pasta soup that I make him. It's one of his favourites. It's got like uh, tortellini pasta in it and lemon and uh, asparagus and broccoli and chicken, of course, and got all th good things in it. So I made him up a giant pot of soup and made him more because he had to take time off work. And in the five years that we've lived here, he's never taken a sick day. So this was a first. And he actually had to take like the week off work sick. And uh, so I was looking after him and Buddy as well, which I've explained uh, all his multiple seizures that he's been having. So basically I was playing nursemaid. And to be honest, I actually felt a bit smug, you know, because I thought Millie's been sick, Buddy's been sick, David's sick, I'm looking after him now. And I'm not sick so, you know, yay for me. I feel pretty good. You know, I feel pretty good about myself and I feel pretty smug that I haven't caught the super bug and yay. <laughs> and David, of course, had to go to the doctors and they said it would take, uh, you know, 10 days for this uh, super bug to sort of really clear out of your system. And he, of course, had to take that time off and I looked after him for the whole time for the first four or five days and then guess who got the super bug? Me! <laughs> and by then of course all the soup and all the homemade things that I'd made for David had run out and we were basically so sick that it was too hard to go to the shopping centre or the supermarket with both of us feeling so bad so we ended up having like packet soups and I was having terrible food and as many of you know I'm diabetic so it was just completely off the rails and being so sick I couldn't exercise so my sugar levels my glucose levels for diabetes would have been off the rails but there was um, I didn't test them Anyway, I finally got over the virus, but one of the effects of diabetes is if you sort of don't take care of yourself. For some people, like me, I get a lot of infections and uh, lumps or abscesses and things like that. So I felt like about just after I'd recovered from this awful virus, I felt that I had a lump 
which is not unusual. I've had a heap of them. And it was about as big as like a dime or a penny. So it wasn't very big. So I didn't really give it much attention. Within a couple of days, it was as big as a golf ball. And I thought, hmm, okay, I better go to the doctor and get a pile of antibiotics. But because I'm allergic to penicillin and any derivative of penicillin, I have to have a special sort of antibiotic and I have to go pretty hard. So I was taking nine antibiotics a day, but by then, and by the time I'd started the antibiotics, the golf ball had actually increased and it was now the size of a ruler with a golf ball. And it was in a very delicate part of my body. Put it this way, I couldn't drive <laughs> and I couldn't bend over and it was it was really quite painful and quite uncomfortable. And so after being on the antibiotics for uh, about three or four days or five days and going to the doctor every day because she likes to monitor that sort of stuff, she said that it was just not going not healing more, not clearing up at the pace that she would be happy with. And so she wanted to open it up. And of course, if you know me, you know I've got extreme medical anxiety. Just going to the doctor is an issue for me. And for the last two years, my doctor here in Queensland has been practicing putting the blood pressure cuff on me because that's something that really freaks me out. And Prior to that, no one had been able to do that without me kicking and screaming and giving them every swear word that I know in multiple languages. And of course, my big fear is having a needle and going to hospital. So anyway, she pumped me up with some Valium for overnight and then the next day. And of course, I had to get David to take more time off work because I was having this little minor cut, only minor and it was just in the doctor's surgery, not in hospital or anything. And um, I needed Buddy's, someone to give Buddy his medication. He has medication six times a day. So I needed David to uh, take the day off work just so that Buddy could have his meds. And so anyway, um, I had another Valium just before she did the surgery and... Uh, you know, watch some hypnosis videos and all the rest of it and, you know, got into a good place as far as the needle goes and, you know, was able to do that and it was all good and I had to come back the next day just for a checkup just to make sure that everything would now be progressing well. So, of course, I come back the next day, but overnight I'd had a fever and my temperature had actually got up quite high, but I was freezing cold. And, you know, that had gone on multiple times during the night. And, you know, I was at 38, 39 degrees and well, 38 and a half, 39. It was like the lotto numbers without any winnings. And when she took my temperature on the Friday, she wasn't pleased with the recovery. She wasn't pleased with the antibiotics. And when she took my temperature, she basically said I had to go to an emergency at the hospital because there was a real risk that my wound was going to become septic and uh, I'd, you know, be in a hell of a lot more trouble. So I had to uh, call up David and get him to come home from work. And of course, I was absolutely freaking out. This is my worst nightmare, going to hospital and having a needle and having a drip. It's just like my worst nightmare. The last time I had a drip in hospital, there were six medical staff holding me down. And uh, I just really didn't want to do it. But I had a sense of hope that last time she sent me to the emergency department, I refused the drip, the needle and everything else. And they allowed me to continue with the antibiotics and you know everything kind of worked out well <laughs> you know it was just a lot slower than what it was and you know I did have some ongoing problems etc but you know I was kind of hoping it'd be like last time 
So David came home from work and he took me to the emergency department, but there was a huge lineup, so many people waiting because a lot of the bulk billing for medical attention has changed in Australia. Whereas uh, I know in America, you guys, you, you pay for everything. But in Australia, we have something called Medicare, where you can get bulk billing at doctors, meaning you don't pay any money. It was all covered by Medicare. But now there's what's called a gap. And some doctors charge a fee between the costs that Medicare gives and what their charge is. And it's usually about 20 or so dollars. And for some people, the cost of living is really striking them so hard that this fee is too much and they're going to the hospital instead where the treatment is for free. So it was crowded as. So we waited for an hour and a half and uh, we got to triage pretty quickly. And of course, when they took my temperature, they said I had to, you know, go to emergency. Um, you know, there was no two ways about it type thing because I was, um, you know, at 39 degrees and... Yeah, it was, uh, you know, time to, to get some treatment. But, of course, you know, I'm sitting there panicking in my worst-case scenario of being in a hospital, and I had to send David home because Buddy needed his medication. And, you know, that was like an hour-long round trip for him to go back home, give Buddy his medication and come back again. But it kind of worked out all right. I had the best emergency doctor I have ever had. She was just so compassionate and understanding of someone with extreme anxiety like I have. And she was just unbelievable. She was so unbelievable. I wish I could find her in the emergency department and give her a big bunch of flowers. But, um, the, you know, due to their different shifts and whatnot, and you can't access that department unless you're going in, I wouldn't be able to find her. But I did, uh, you know, write to the hospital and specifically request that they personally thank her. And uh, the nurse that she got that was really experienced with people with a, a needle phobia, because honestly, they I couldn't have done it without them. I really, really couldn't. And uh, so anyway, they gave me a Valium and by the time the, the Valium was uh, kicking in, David had returned from giving Buddy his meds and then they were able to, you know, do their stuff with um, a drip and, and with, uh, you know, taking blood. I'm not going to talk about that because I, even though I did it, I still have huge anxiety about it. And anyway, they were able to do that. And the nurse was just a fabulous. They were just so wonderful. If you're in Brisbane, Prince Charles Hospital at Chermside, I can't say enough good things about them. I really, they were really, really wonderful. Um, and particularly with someone with extreme anxiety. And so anyway, um, you know, the allergy to penicillin's a bit of an issue, so they had to, uh, you know, make up special stuff, and I had to go on the wards and stay, and uh, multiple surgeons, you know, came through the night. Of course, I had to send David home, so I was there by myself, but, um, you know, luckily for most of it, the Valium was still, still working, and um, I had to send David home because Buddy needed his meds and um, so of course uh, I was there for a couple of days um, and I never expected it that I would be there so I just had my phone and no charger and um, no clothes, no toothbrush, no nothing and I felt like a filthy pig. I really did. I just wanted to get out get home and have a decent shower and you know just get over it but I still had fevers through the night, even with the antibiotic drip. So I had that for like two days. And uh, yeah, they said it was pretty severe. Um, and so, yeah, so I had a nice little hospital stay for a few days and uh, had an ultrasound and the surgeons, um, because there was still stuff there, they wanted to cut me again. But ultimately, after a day or so, they decided that it would gradually go away on its own. They did more ultrasounds and things like that. But it was, you know, 
quite difficult, especially when David couldn't be there. He was only there for the the worst bit for me, and uh, because he had to, someone had to go home and look after Buddy. And I remember, like the first night I was there, I was ringing David at like six o'clock in the morning. And even on the night before, I was ringing him on Buddy's medication, you know, to say, give Buddy these tablets, give Buddy these tablets. And I usually do, like, his pill caddy on the the a particular day of a week. And that pill caddy's got all these little pills, you know, for every day of the week. But I didn't realise I wouldn't be coming home from the hospital. I didn't realise they would admit me to the ward. I thought that... I would be able to talk my way out of it and uh, I wouldn't get admitted. So I had to, you know, ring David up constantly and say, I want you to get this packet out of here and take one tablet and, you know, give it to Buddy. So, uh, yeah, if unfortunately it ever happens again, I need to make sure that the pill caddies all worked out for David. But, uh, yeah, it was an experience and uh, one I hope not to repeat. But I think it actually has helped me with my anxiety because I know that I can do it and I just need, you know, a really good support staff around me and David and, you know, some Valium. <laughs> so I guess from that point of view, it was good. But uh, so after they let me out of jail, I think they marked my file with, can I go home, please? Because that's all I ever said to them. Can I go home, please? Can I go home, please? You know, give the bed to somebody else that's really sick. You know, I don't need to be here. I feel fine. Can I go home, please? And they'd say, no, you've still got a temperature. You've got to stay. And, yeah, so uh, when I did uh, finally get released, I still had to go to see the doctor every day. And she was still keeping an eye on my temperature. And she said I still wasn't out of the woods yet. So I've got my, hopefully last appointment tomorrow and of course I've had to have dressings changed and things like that so hopefully I've got my last appointment with my doctor tomorrow and hopefully she gives me the all clear and everything is okay yeah so that's basically it but unfortunately when I went to see her yesterday she told me some terrible news that she's actually leaving at the end of the month and uh, she's going to a new practice which will be about 40 minutes away so I said that's fine I'm going to go there because without her, I would never have been able to have the blood pressure cuff on all the practice that she's done with me over the years of me sitting down on her, letting it, her putting it on has just taught me so much. And that was just, it was then so easy for me to spend time in hospital because they take your blood pressure all the time. And that used to just freak me out beyond belief. And, you know, all that practice that she did just made it so much easier. So I will, of course, be following her because I'm not over this anxiety yet. And, um, you know, I still need, I think, you know, more help and support trying to get through it, if that makes sense. So, and she's the only one that, in all this time has ever helped me get this far so yeah I'll travel the the 40 minutes there and the 40 minutes back again and that'll be fine no problem at all but uh yes yeah, so that's what I've been doing and you know hopefully everything is all fine now and I think the lesson to be learned is you know if you're diabetic you've just got to keep an eye out on these things it's just worse and, uh, you know, it's worse if you're allergic to penicillin and, you know, if you end up getting something and it sort of knocks your whole schedule and routine out, you just got to find a way to work around it. Like, we could have, you know, ordered things online and got delivery and things like that. So, you know, there were other things that we could have done rather than just sort of go downhill, but uh, a lesson to be learned. <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to leave it here. Uh, next time that we chat, I'll be telling you a story that the main characters, they should have a movie made about them. It is just such an amazing story. And it's just really, it's just so heartbreaking. 
Anyway, that'll be on my crime and colouring special, and so that'll be next time. But until next time, stay safe. Thanks for listening, and happy colouring.